Thank you. Good evening, I'm Christy Madden from the State Library of Queensland and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the, tr the traditional owners of the land, the Turrbal people and the Yugara people and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. We're pleased to present tonight's talk, Global Dickens, as part of the National Year of Reading. The National Year of Reading 2012 is about children learning to read and keen readers finding new sources of inspiration. It's about supporting reading initiatives while respecting the oral tradition of storytelling. It's about helping people discover and rediscover the magic of books. And most of all, it's about Australians becoming a nation of readers. There are programs, events and resources available all year round, so visit the lovetoread.org.au website for more information. We are also obviously here tonight to celebrate Charles Dickens' 200th birthday. Throughout 2012, institutions and organisations from all over the world have been and will continue acknowledging the great works of a great man by delivering a program of events, activities, exhibitions and festivals to commemorate this very special anniversary. And SLQ is proud to be one of them. Although a writer from the Victorian era, Dickens' work transcends his time, language and culture. He remains a massive contemporary influence throughout the world and his writings continue to inspire film, television, art, literature, artists and academia. Tonight we are privileged to host a panel of international speakers including Professor Regina Gagne, Professor Michael Hollington and Dr Cathy Waters and this panel will be chaired by Dr David Ellison. David is a senior lecturer in literary studies at Griffith University. He has research interests in Victorian literature and culture, domesticity, technology, sorry, technology and architecture. His current research project, Home Discontents, challenges accounts of comfort's pro progressive triumph over the Victorian home, focusing instead on discomfort's curious dispersion into everyday practices that, that shape modern life. Following our conversation, there will be an opportunity for audience questions. And as we are recording the talk, we will need you all to wait for the roving microphone to reach you before you ask your question. Please also be aware that we will be video recording this evening's discussion and question time for our online web webcast and for broadcast on ABC's Big Ideas. If you have any concerns with this, please come and see me or one of the other SLQ staff. If you would like to comment or follow the discussion online, please use the Twitter hashtag SLQDTC. And now I'd like to introduce Michael to do a special reading from one of our great favourites, Great Expectations. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how special. Can you all hear me? <laughs> Good. Um, the magic of words, uh, as um, my colleague just said, uh, is important for Dickens and uh, above all, I think, reading aloud is part of the essential magic. Uh, he do the police in different voices is a, a praise of sloppy in Our Mutual Friend, the orphan boy who turns the mangle um, for Betty Higdon. He do the police in different voices sums up what, you know, Dick, reading Dickens aloud is about trying to do the police in different voices, so I'll try. <laughs> my father's family name being Pirip, and my Christian name Philip, my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip, and came to be called Pip. I give Pirip is my father's family name on the authority of his tombstone and my sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, who married the blacksmith. As I never saw my father or my mother and never saw any likeness of either of them, for their days were long before the days of photographs, my first fancies regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstone. The shape of the letters on my father's gave me an odd idea that he was a square, stout, dark man with curly black hair. From the character and turn of the inscription, also Georgiana, wife of the above, I drew a childish conclusion that my mother was freckled and sickly. 
to five little stone lozenges, each about a foot and a half long, which were arranged in a neat row beside their grave and were sacred to the memory of five little brothers of mine who gave up trying to get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle. I am indebted for a belief I religiously entertained that they'd all been born on their backs with their hands in their trust pockets and had never taken them out in this state of existence. Ours was the marsh country, down by the river within, as the river wound 20 miles of the sea. My first, most vivid and broad impression of the identity of things seems to me to have been gained on a memorable raw afternoon towards evening. At such a time, I found out for certain that this bleak place overgrown with nettles was the churchyard, and that Philip Pirrip, late of this parish, and also Georgina, wife of the above, were dead and buried, and that Alexander, Bartholomew, Abraham, Tobias, and Roger, infant children of the aforesaid, were also dead and buried and that the dark, flat wilderness beyond the churchyard, intersected with dikes and mounds and gates, with scattered cattle feeding on it, was the marshes, and that the low, leaden line beyond was the river, and that the distant, savage lair from which the wind was rushing was the sea, and that the small bundle of shivers, growing afraid of it all and beginning to cry, was pit. Hold your noise, cried a terrible voice as a man started up from among the graves at the side of the church porch. Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. A fearful man, all in coarse grey, with a great iron on his leg, a man with no hat and with broken shoes and with an old rag tied round his head. A man who had been soaked in water and smothered in mud and lain by stones and cut by flints and stung by nettles and torn by briars, who limped and shivered and glared and growled and whose teeth chattered in his head as he seized me by the chin. Oh, don't cut my throat, sir, I pleaded in terror. Pray don't do it, sir. Tell us your name, said the man. Quick. Pip, sir. Once more, said the man, staring at me. Give it mouth. Pip, Pip, sir. Show us where you live, said the man. Point out the place. I pointed to where our village lay, on the flat inshore, among the alder trees and pollards, a mile or more from the church. The man, after looking at me for a moment, turned me upside down and emptied my pockets. There was nothing in them but a piece of bread. When the church came to itself, for it was so sudden and strong that he made it go head over heels before me, and I saw the steeple under my feet. When the church came to itself, I say, I was seated on a high tombstone, trembling, while he ate the bread ravenously. You young dog, said the man, licking his lips. What? Fat cheeks you got. I believe they were fat, though I was at that time undersized for my year and not strong. Damn me if I couldn't eat them, said the man with a threatening shake of his head. And if I hadn't half a mind to do it. I earnestly expressed my hope that he wouldn't, and held tighter to the tombstone on which he had put me, partly to keep myself upon it, partly to keep myself from crying. Now then, looky here, said the man. Where's your mother? There, sir, said I. He started, made a short run, and stopped and looked over his shoulder. There, sir. I'm sorry, that's the wrong voice. There, sir, <laughs> I timidly explained. Also, Georgiana, that's my mother. Oh, said he, coming back. And is that your father along of your mother? Yes, sir, said I. Him too, late of this parish. Ah, oh, he muttered then, considering. Who'd you live with? 
supposing you kindly let to live, which I ain't made my mind up about yet. My sister, sir, Mrs. Joe Gargery, wife of Joe Gargery, the blacksmith, sir. Blacksmith, eh? said he, and he looked down at his leg. After darkly looking at his leg and at me several times, he came closer to my tombstone, took me by both arms, and tilted me back so far as he could hold me, so that his eyes looked most powerfully down into mine, and mine looked most helplessly up into his. Now looky here, he said, the question being whether you're to be let to live. You know what a file is? Yes, sir. And you know what Whittles is? Yes, sir. After each question, he tilted me over a little more, so as to give me a greater sense of helplessness and danger. You get me a file, he tilted me back again. And you get me Whittles, he tilted me again. You bring them both to me, he tilted me again. Or I'll have your heart and your liver out, he tilted me again. I was dreadfully frightened and so giddy that I clung to him with both hands and said, if you kindly please let me keep upright, sir, perhaps I shouldn't be sick and perhaps I should attend more. He gave me a most tremendous dip and roll so that the church jumped over its own weathercock. Then he held me by the arms in an upright position on the top of the stone and went on in these dreadful terms. You bring me tomorrow morning early, that file and them whittles. You bring the lot to me, that, that old battery over yonder. You do it. You never dare to say a word or dare to make a sign concerning your having seen such a person as me or any person whatsoever, and you shall be let to live. You fail, or you go from my words in any particular, no matter how small it is, and your heart and your liver shall be tore out, toasted, and it. Now I ain't alone, though you may think I am. There's a young man with me, in comparison with which young man I am an angel. That young man hears the words I speak. That young man has a secret way peculiar to himself of getting at a boy and at his heart and at his liver. It is in vain for a boy to arrange to hide himself from that young man. A boy may lock his door, may be warm in bed, may tuck himself up, may draw the clothes over his head, may think himself comfortable and safe, but the, yeah, that young man will softly creep and creep his way to him and tear him open. I am keeping that young man from arming of you at the present moment with great difficulty. I find it very hard to hold that young man off your inside. Now, what do you say? I said, I would get him the file, and I would get him that what broken bits of food I could, and I would come to him at the battery early in the morning. Say, Lord, strike you dead if you don't, said the man. I said so, and he took me down. Now, he pursued, you remember what you undertook? And you remember that young man, and you get home. Uh, good, good night, sir, I faltered. Much for that, said he, glancing about him over the cold, wet flat. I wish I was a frog or an eel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's appropriate um, for a birthday to offer gifts, and I think we've had one there. That's, and the gifts will continue because we have uh, quite an esteemed panel here. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce each of our speakers, and then we'll have a conversation about Dickens and trying to measure what this year means and what his influence continues to be, both in 2012 and looking back. Um, our speakers, I'll begin at the end here with uh, Professor Regina Garnier. Uh, Professor Garnier has been enormously influential in the field of Victorian studies, really giving shape to much of its preoccupations, its methodologies, its themes. Uh, her work is tremendous, uh, and it's a great pleasure to have her here. She's visiting from Exeter University. Uh, she's won numerous awards uh, for her teaching and for her research. 
and she currently holds the McGeorge Fellow uh, of uh, the University of Melbourne. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that she is currently president of the British Association of Victorian Studies. Moving along, and the person you just heard from is Michael Hollington. Uh, Michael was professor of English at the University of New South Wales until 2002. Uh, he continued for some time as, uh, university, as a professor at the University of Toulouse in France until he retired. Uh, he is a powerhouse of Dickens, as you may have noticed, uh, and has been extremely active in the lead up to 2012 uh, and does a great deal of work uh, plotting, mapping uh, the influence of Dickens uh, beyond England, uh, particularly in Europe and beyond. And finally, uh, uh, Catherine Waters is reader in the School of English at the University of Kent. Uh, she's published uh, a number of terrific books, really, really wonderful books, uh, including Dickens and the Politics of Family, which I can't re recommend highly enough, and her more recent Social Life of Goods, which is also superb. Uh, she is on the uh, editorial advisory board of the Dickens Journal Online Project, which is one of very, uh, a number of really interesting uh, efforts to place Dickens's work, which was voluminous and across so many different media, getting that online so that more people can access it. Uh, so um, let's start off. And the question I had, given that it's 2012, and uh, which is, of course, the bicentenary of his birth, is why are we actually still concerned about Dickens? When you think how extravagantly wasteful we are with our culture, we let books go out of print all the time. Uh, books that we will have read as children, as young adults, books that we might have read five years ago are gone. So the fact that we would keep someone, keep reviving him, uh, and, and keep uh, allowing him or arguing for his relevance is an extraordinary activity. Uh, so I suppose my first question then is really, uh, and I'm going to direct this first to Regina, is what is it about Dickens that makes this possible? Okay, well first he is the most widely read author historically after Shakespeare in English. So he, uh, uh, more than any other English author um, after Shakespeare, Dickens is the first one. Now if you trace Dickens's works around the world, what probably the majority of readers will say are that questions about social justice come up with Dickens. Dickens is an author who is interested in a society that is very much in transformation, which most societies have been since Dickens was, write, since Dickens was writing. Dickens is concerned with the social relations of things like class, which in other cultures end up being translated in terms of things like caste. Um, he is interested in um, poverty, He's interested in children. Uh, a whole literature about orphans has come up in China after people read Dickens, in Brazil, in Argentina. Um, probably Dickens' influence on um, the way that children have been treated is enormous. And in generally, questions of social justice, questions of inequality, questions of poverty are what you see time and time again uh, for the, uh, the significance of Dickens in terms of his global reputation. Okay, within English speaking cultures, Dickens has been many, many other things as well. But if you look at actually how he's known in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, very often it has been um, from the, about the 1880s on, it's been about questions of social justice. Michael, I know you've been involved in celebrating and acknowledging Dickens uh, around Europe. You've been doing quite a bit of globe trotting for the last few years. Can you talk about the reception of Dickens, what Dickens means beyond the English-speaking world? Yes. Uh, can I first of all say why I think Dickens is universal? It's because mm. he's, in fact, a creator of myths, something deeper even than language, if you like, that these uh, uh, Oliver asking for more uh, leap out of the page and can be translated into all sorts of mm. different media so that Dickens, uh, uh, perhaps to a great extent, any other writer exists in a number of forms. Now, I started as a child um, with Classics Illustrated, comic books. There's an essay by Angus Wilson, Dickens a Childhood Haunting, and that was true of me. I was scared of monks in particular in Oliver Twist. There's this black silhouette in the, in the comic, and I hated him. Anyway, but I'm not answering your question, Europe, and how Dickens is um, 
I have answered it, I hope, in a very general way, that he's capable of being uh, translated into so many uh, 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 forms. But uh, also, following up on Virginia, I think Dickens is very political at all stages, for good or bad. You know, there are those who are anti-Dickens. He was a uh, uh, persona non grata for the Nazis, in, as you might expect. The only person they admired in Victorian England was Carlyle. Um, hero and the idea of leadership. Um, but in the beginning, in the 19th century, Dickens chimed in with all the great national liberation movements in Europe. He was a hero to them, and he actually was involved in them. You know, he helped literally with uh, one particular country I studied uh, quite carefully is, is Italy, uh, and uh, he was very active in the Risorgimento, or in the British support anyway, for the it Italian liberation. And that paid back, I think, in terms of the critical reception. Those people saw in Dickens a champion of the oppressed. Uh, uh, uh. Later that faded, you know, in Germany, for instance, as Germany becomes itself a leading country. In the beginning, Dickens is seen as a great hero of uh, liberation for Germany too. Later, they uh, are less interested in English writing and more assertive of their own culture, which is only to be accepted. But Dickens took root, I think, in this period where he was seen as the champion of all kinds of national liberations in Europe. Uh, Kathy, I know you're in South East England, in Kent, and uh, you've, you've, you've witnessed the flourishing and the flowering of, uh, of, of this Dickens celebration uh, this year and the lead up to it. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of things that are happening and how they register and, and maybe venture uh, some thoughts on why, why that is happening? Yes, well, of course, Dickens um, spent some very happy early childhood years in Kent, so he's special to Kent for that reason, the Chatham, Rochester area in particular. And uh, in fact, I've been involved in planning meetings with the Tourism South East for the last, well, three years they've been planning for this year, all kinds of events, celebratory. Um, there are Dickens celebrations every year anyway, Broadstairs has its own Dickens Festival in June. Rochester has a Dickens Festival. There are strong branches of the Dickens Fellowship. So it happens anyway, but as you say, this year is, is particularly special. There's been a very conscious effort made to involve the schools. We've got reading competitions happening. Um, there have uh, been various conferences going on. Uh, television programs, BBC's been featuring it across the birthday week. There was a wonderful special screening of David Lean's magical film of Great Expectations in Rochester Cathedral at the end of the birthday week on a huge screen, digitally enhanced print. I've only ever seen the film on the television, so to see it up there on the big screen was really marvellous. And uh, so there are a few of the things that are going on, and, and it, it's because he was born there but because also Dickens is very bankable, I have to say, for mm. Kent and for the tourist industry. And uh, you only got to walk down the high street of Rochester and note the names on the shops, Mr Pips, the grocers, yeah. uh, grape expectations, the wine <laughs> merchants. Um, Artful Dodger pub. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so it's, it's got a very strong commercial importance as well as the, the cultural importance for the region. Mm. Let me say something about the British Council, okay? Yeah. The British Council has been very much participating in uh, Dickens 2012, and one of the things they did was organize a 24-hour readathon where they put out a call for um, readers across the world to read one um, book per hour per a day. Yeah, and so there would be 24 of Dickens' works that would actually be read out. They had 66 different countries respond, and they had three million responses from China alone. Three million responses from China alone. And first off the, first off the bat was, of course, Australia. Mm. It's always first with mm -hmm. the New Year's celebrations. We, it, was, it started with Miriam Margulies, really, didn't That's it? That's right, yeah. yeah. 
Um, Regina, since you've mentioned China, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about the reception of mm. Dickens in Asia in particular. With the exception of during the Cultural Revolution from 1996 to 76, Dickens has been read consistently since the late 19th century in China. His first translator was um, Lin Shu, and Lin Shu translated about 300 European novels for the Chinese at the end of the 19th century. Um, he translated a number of Dickens novels and Lin Xu knew no English at all. Lin Xu did his translations by working with an amanuensis who did know English, who would read out to Lin Xu the plot, the narrative of the Dickens book, and then Lin Xu would summarize it in such a way that it would be relevant to his readers, who were essentially at that time the literati mm -hmm. in China. And so there was no word-to-word -word translation at all. It was all about the movement of the plot, the movement of the incident, the movement of the emotion. Um, and that is the way that Dickens actually entered Chinese literature. And when you read the early Chinese scholars writing about it, what they were concerned about at that moment in China was um, science, democracy. They were interested in opening up China away from its 3,000 years of tradition, largely Confucian. And when they talked about Dickens, what they said is he writes about the cries of grievance of the poor. They were interested in using Dickens to actually work on their own societies, which were largely, up to that point, traditional, very small literacy, and they were interested in opening it up. It was called the May 4th Movement as it moved into the 20th century. And that continued um, throughout um, the 20th century, where people would read Dickens. They were interested in the early works um, the, uh, at that point, much more than the later works. Um, but once the, um, the, the PRC was founded in 1949, they started looking at Dickens' late works really closely then, scholars looking at Dickens' late works for the first time because they saw them as profound critiques of capitalism. Yeah, they saw Dickens as somebody who actually demystified capitalism and showed what was wrong with it. And so at that point, he was instituted into the literature of the PRC. And then there was the Cultural Revolution where no Western works were read for a while. And then after that, um, there is now enormous numbers of translations of Dickens. I mean, enormous numbers of translations of mm. Dickens, hundreds and hundreds. And what about his influence for other Chinese writers? Is, is this something yeah. that shows yeah. up in the One of the most famous modern Chinese writers is Lao Xia. Um, and Lao Xia wrote Rickshaw Boy. Um, I expect many of you have read Rickshaw Boy. Um, and that Lao Xia was directly, um, he stated that he was directly influenced by Dickens' representation of the poor. The Rickshaw Boy is somebody who actually is trying very, very hard to make it, as Pip does, on his own merits and finds that the structures of the society itself, the unjust structures of society, prevent him with all the hard work in the world from moving forward. And at that point, Lao Xia actually changed his view about what an individual could do in an unjust society. He, he actually started a whole critical tradition with Lu Xun and others at that time um, to say that um, the individual could not operate in an unjust society. It would be quite impossible to do what one intended to do. Mm -hmm. So um, there was philosophically all kinds of engagement with the issues that Dickens was dealing with. Mm. Um, if I could step back for a moment away from the broader sense of Dickens expanding into the globe and coming back to Dickens the writer. And Michael, you mentioned Dickens is a generator of myth. Uh, and, but the thing that struck me the most was, was that you were frightened of him as a child. Well, perhaps not him, but <laughs> the books. And that's something that rings true to me as well. <laughs> Reading him as a child was terrifying. I had to actually put his book in a special location in the bookshelf where he was buffered by Enid Blyton <laughs> to keep him... <laughs> you know, it's, there are issues. But putting those to one side, uh, I wonder if we could think a little bit about the Dickensian and, and that experience and its, and its relationship to the grotesque because so much of Dickens, and obviously this touches on childhood and his interest in imperiled children, but more broadly the way in which the city, a house, any location is susceptible 
to this kind of grotesque rendering. Yes, I mean, there's this essentially mixed feature, I think, of, you know, the opening of Great Expectations is a good example. Mm -hmm. And Dickens wrote to Forster saying, such a fine, new, tragic comic. And I think that is the yeah. crucial thing to say. It's funny as well as terrifying. Mm -hmm. And that is the most unsettling and disturbing thing of all, I think, about this, uh, especially for a child because you don't really quite know where you stand at the, the opening. You know, for me, I always laugh when uh, 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 Magwitch asks Pip, where's your mother? And Pip says, there. And he runs away, <laughs> thinking that his mother is there. She's dead in the yeah. ground, you see. Mm -hmm. And they're in this terrible confrontation. And that's the other side, perhaps, of, again, going back to Shurigenia, Dickens is able to sympathise with Magwitch, too, in mm. the beginning. You know, when he, I stop my reading at the point where he says, I wish I were a frog or an eel. You know, in other words, his life is terrible. You know, there he is. With his, and, and we don't forget that, even if he is terrifying. So again, this sort of uncertainty floating a bit between different uh, um, modes. Uh, that's, I think, a hallmark of the Dickens. For me, anyway. One thing you can do with that is, is think about the way that Dickens is able to actually focus on psychological tics manifested through the body, physically manifested things that are going on psychologically with characters. And so you find characters that have phrases they repeat over and over again, or they have a, a tick, or they move in certain ways, or they drag their leg, or something happens that you can actually see the inside psyche coming out visibly. And that character people in ways psychologically that have, you know, weren't understood at all in the science of the 19th century. And you find that being very, very attractive to many, many writers throughout the world. Um, Galdos called it muletilla. Muletilla. It's, 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 it's something where you actually get this kind of little, this little reiteration, this little thing that exposes the psychology in someone. And in New Zealand, Catherine Mansfield called it tagging. And so many, many writers have learned how to use this, this, this metaphoric or this figurative way of actually getting the psychology of these characters. And that's spooky mm, in many ways, is. right? I mean, you're seeing things about people that aren't at the level of the rational. Mm. Yeah, well, that's absolutely right. And they are, it is so psychologically acute. And yet he was criticized for that by many of his contemporaries who saw his characterization yeah. as too thin. Yeah. You know, these were these paper-thin characters who came on, said their little slogans, and left. Yeah, but, but that's in fact, so much what people are like. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, one thing we should probably acknowledge is the extent to which Dickens was very much interested in his fame, uh, was interested in, brand is too strong, but let's call it the Dickens brand. Uh, and and he, he pursued that interest through many different media, one of which was his journalism. And I know, Kathy, that's a particular interest of yours. And I wondered if you could talk about the way in which he managed his career uh, by his, his journalism. Yes, because everybody knows Dickens as a novelist, but his journalism is less well known. And mm. yet he, he really was one of the greatest journalists of the 19th century, as well as the greatest novelist. Um, from, from his early days when he was writing sketches, when he started out as a writer, and he had this long-held ambition to found his own periodical, which wasn't actually realised until the establishment of Household Words in 1850. And uh, from then on until his death in 1870, he was an editor full-time as well as, as doing many other things, writing novels, conducting amateur theatricals, engaging in public readings. Mm. Must have been very difficult to keep up with. Um, so Household Words is established um, and it's, it's Dickens' own periodical in that it has a kind of branding across the top of it conducted by Charles Dickens appears on every page of this journal. Of course, journalism at this point in the 19th century is mostly anonymously published and Dickens had a wide team of contributors. It, the journal was a miscellany. Um, so th the only name that appeared <laughs> in the journal was Dickens's own name attached to <laughs> the novels that he, he published within it. All of his own 
uh, non-fictional journalism appeared anonymously like the rest. But of course, with this branding across the top, it led some readers to assume, <laughs> quite amazingly, that he'd written the whole thing himself, or to attribute some of the pieces contributed by other writers to Dickens too. So it, it, he, he's, he's identified the journal very much personally with himself and the tone that struck is also of his own fashioning too. He wanted the journal to entertain and to instruct. He wanted the um, non-fictional prose within it to be lively and imaginative. And that's a very Dickensian kind of quality mm. too, I think. Mm. And so he's really, he is launching himself as a brand with that journal, I think. Can I just interject uh, mm. apropos of the, conducted by Charles Dickens, I just finished this big project on Dickens in Europe and masses of things are not by Dickens that people say. About in, the, in Sweden, for example, there are dozens of articles published as by Dickens and with the help of John Drew, we were <laughs> able to identify quite a lot of these things that were thought to be by Dickens and said to be by Dickens in Iceland, in Sweden, in everywhere, but they're not by Dickens. He did. Portugal, another place, and lots of them. He, he narrated a, a novel posthumously. Wasn't there a story where someone uh, was in kind of some sort of spiritualist contact yeah, with Dickens? Yes. And there, so there's a posthumous novel as well <laughs> that you take into account. Um, one, one thing that seems uh, unlikely or implausible is looking at the length of the novels and thinking that this would be something that would lend itself to our film culture, our television culture. Uh, I mean, it's, it's odd enough that we are looking back to these stories for a source of contemporary entertainment, but odder still when you think about how sprawling they are and how film is such a selective medium. I wondered if you could all maybe reflect a little bit on, on uh, that transition to film or maybe just think about a film that you particularly like, one that struck you as, as working in some way. I mean, you mentioned the David Lean, which I think is spot on. Uh, and I'm glad they, they did that, and I hope it was by way of apologising for the recent... I mean, if you think of the influence, <laughs> if you actually think of the influence, Eisenstein, Griffith, yes, of course, yeah. Lean, Chaplin, Burstall, Green, I mean, these are all filmmakers who have made films of Dickens according to their own times and their places. And it was I, the great Russian um, filmmaker Eisenstein, who said that Griffith took his notion of montage That's from right. Dickens. Yeah. Right, from Dickens. And so they have always said that Dickens' panorama, right, Dickens is, uh, it's not just the panorama, it's not just the scope of it, it's also the perspective of Dickens, constantly getting the different perspectives that lead to that notions of montage. The, the principle of the streaky bacon uh, is yeah. the, uh, how Dickens formulates the montage idea that you cut yeah. from the white of the bacon to the red of the bacon. Uh, in uh, Oliver Twist, he, he talks about the streaky yeah. bacon, and uh, it's quite clear. So that Dickens is not only just you know, someone who has been made films out of, he is part of the very basis of the film. The technique of montage is something that Griffith and Eisenstein learned from Dickens' his own technique of cutting between and lean again in um, say great expectations and there's Pip and he looks out the window and there is uh, a cut to an execution you know men being hung uh, and that swift and momentary um, move from one thing to another is a first of all a, a whole, the Dickensian quintessentially Dickensian and quintessentially part of the aesthetic of the film. Mm -hmm. There's a Sorry. I was just saying, there's strong visual qualities to the, the passage that Michael read out. You could see the camera swing round uh, you know, to focus on Pip himself, seen from without. Uh, it, it's very filmic. Yes, it is. It is. Virginia, you wanted to Yeah, say? there's a 1955 version, a Hong Kong version of Great Expectations where Bruce Lee played Pip. Right. So you can think about you can wow. think about Bruce Lee playing the figure that um, that Michael was reading, um, and yeah. in that what they did was they simply selected um, the characters according to the models that were then used in Chinese literature, which was the peasant, the worker. These were under Mao, the peasant, the worker, the soldier. Um, and um, the um, teacher. And so you had the characters actually falling into that. There was no Estella, 
there was none of the, of the characters that you sort of have ambivalence about, but they actually used it to make a work for um, the Chinese Revolution. And so you see, again, everywhere, people picking up these, these sorts of themes. Does he fight? <laughs> um, this is before, this is early, okay. this is before his fighting career, okay. um, but, um, but yes, there's a bit of that, yeah. And he's there to save, he doesn't have great expectations about being a gentleman, not that, that is a, an individualist model. He has great expectations to save his village, and so what he's doing um, is, is, is going back to his village where he wants to be a doctor, and he wants to elevate the village. The great expectations are on behalf of the village in that version. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, in, in those, those translations of, in particular, that story, where obviously they're changing it from that individual problem to a social one, yeah. does the Estella romance figure at all? Is no, she's she not there. She's no, Biddy's disappeared there. from... Biddy's there. Biddy, Biddy okay. is the character that's in that. Yeah. That's fascinating. And do they yeah. end up together? Is that... um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. For old Joe. <laughs> For old Joe, exactly. See, this is a different way of thinking of Dickens, though. You can think of Dickens in terms of appreciation. Mm. You can think of him in terms of his influence. Or you can see what happens when Dickens comes in contact with another culture. And this, the, the kind of work that I do is less Dickens' appreciation. It's more about Dickens in contact with other cultures and what happens when you bring the cultures, um, when, when, when that happens. I'm, I'm not concerned about fidelity to Dickens' works as much as I'm interested in what happens when these, at certain moments, cultures will produce certain kinds of work. So you can get Dickensian novels or Dickensian characters that simply come out of the conditions that might be similar to the conditions in which Dickens was writing. And this is also happening in Middle Eastern cultures as well, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, Dickens, Dickens was translated, the first Dickens translated was A Tale of Two Cities um, in Arabic in, um, at the first centenary of his birth, so a hundred years ago. That was the first translation. <laughs> um, and then what they did in Arabic was used by a lot of the education ministers who um, used Dickens to actually try to bring more social justice to the societies, to societies that were vastly unequal. And so they would use Dickens' characters. There was also a huge literature of um, what they called Nelliads um, from, um, from Little Nell, of uh, stories about children. All the children in Dickens had individual little vignettes written about them as stories of children that were meant to be fostering educational programs um, within Egypt, for example. That's the example that I know best. Mm. And perhaps if we could continue our tour of the globe. I know, Michael, you've just come back from Iceland. Uh, what are they doing <laughs> with Dickens in Iceland? What about Dickens and Iceland? Mm. Um, well, uh, there is no novel translated into Icelandic, um, but there are lots of tales. And that, I mean, the principle that interests me there is that Dickens is adapted to fit national cultures. And in Iceland, the tale is the great tradition, so that in uh, uh, Spain, he's adapted to fit. Uh, Cervantes uh, uh, in, in Greece, he's the Homer of domesticity is the phrase about him, so that he's somehow uh, uh, assimilated into the culture um, of, a, uh, of a given place. Um, I want to say, if I may, here at this moment, um, it's important to see how many great writers owe so much mm. to Dickens and revere him and uh, the highest two must be Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Uh, Tolstoy said, um, sift the 19th century and Dickens will remain. Sift Dickens and David Copperfield will remain. And he made an effort, he was in London, to hear Dickens reading his own work, you know, when Dickens started the readings. And Dostoevsky um, he was imprisoned, you know, he was condemned to death and then sent to Siberia, then reprieved, and it's extraordinary. And the only two books he is known to have read are uh, uh, Pickwick Papers and David Copperfield in prison. Indeed, there's some evidence to say that he refused other books. You know, and throughout his life. Recently, I've been involved in an extraordinary scandal. Uh, the uh, idea that um, 
Dickens and Dostoevsky met, um, there was an article uh, claiming this. I'm now pretty certain, I'm 99.9% certain, this is a hoax, but a lot of people have fallen for it. <laughs> um, uh, Michael Slater, in his, the first edition of his biography, although he retracted it, and um, Claire Tomlin, in her biography, uh, apparently not noticing that Michael Slater had uh, retracted it, in, uh, uh, carries on this uh, um, uh, uh, tradition that Dickens and Dostoevsky met in the summer of 1862. Not true. <laughs> But it feels like it should be true. <laughs> um, Kathy, can you talk a little bit about, uh, again, coming back to the bicentennial and the way that Dickens, the man, figures in the public imagination now? Uh, let me think. Well, this is, I mean, revered in some instances, um, seen as, uh, well, no, uh, he, he um, he, he looms larger, I suppose, is what I would want to say, in the public imagination in the UK than I've been aware of him doing in Australia, and that's something I've noticed, I mm. suppose, with my shift over there, and particularly because of where I'm located and uh, the sort of evidences I was talking about before of shops and schools and streets being named after Dickens' characters and so on. So um, it's got good and bad aspects to it. I was thinking, as we've been talking about translation here, of a, what shall I call it, a translation into youth speak that uh, came out last year, I think the year before. All Dickens' novels boil down into nine pages each. <laughs> with <laughs> titles like Da Well Good Odds and Sods Shop or um, Our Mutual Bro. <laughs> 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 um, Please, sir, give me some more is the title of the, the book. Yeah, so, that one, that you know, it, itself, he figures yeah. in all sorts of ways, good and bad. So. Um, thank you. I mean, the Dickens Fellowship is something we could mention in yes, this context, please, right? Yes, the Dickens Fellowship was founded in 1902 or three, mm. 1902. Yeah. Um, and it, um, it was actually founded um, to enact the principles of social care and welfare and well-being that they that the founders thought that would be part of the spirit of Charles Dickens. And so the first thing that it did was feed the homeless. And um, it had a real social policy. And these, these institutions of the Dickens Fellowship multiplied. Um, there was three by 1903. There are now 57 worldwide, three in Australia, one in New Zealand, 28 in the US. Um, but they're, 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 they're coming up all around the world, and they still have those same principles. They still work as philanthropic associations, and they're people who read Dickens, and they talk about Dickens's work, but the social mission is still very much a part of the Dickens Fellowship, and that is a practical way um, that people get involved mm. in that. Thank you for that. Um, we have time for some questions, if people wanted to ask about Dickens about any of the works. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a microphone that is roving about, so if you'd just like to put your hand up, the microphone will come to you. Yes, down here. This one over here. Uh, this one there we are, okay. Thank you very much. It's on. Thank you very it much is. for that. I just wanted to ask, given your comments about Dickens being read aloud, whether you thought that reflected in the number of movies uh, that have been made re relating to his story, and many series that have been made relating to his stories. Sorry, so, so I, 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 I might didn't miss hear. the question. Oh, but I'm pretty dead. The so. fact that uh, you said earlier about Dickens needing to be read aloud and the different voices. Oh, that sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just wondered whether that reflected in the number of different miniseries and films that have been made, whether it's actually predating the genre mm. and, it, and it kind of is Absolutely. just ready-made, not only the, the scenes that are produced, but the, uh, the, the characterizations. It's one of the most fundamental things to understand about Dickens. Dickens is an actor, a performer, and his, in a certain sense, his 
uh, works would, would, are to be performed. I'm sorry I didn't hear you the first time. But <laughs> uh, yeah, he, I mean, there's this famous occasion when he was a young man and he wanted to be an actor. That was his... And uh, uh, on the day of his audition for some prestigious company, he had a cold and didn't turn up. And, you know, through that contingency, he became a novelist instead, you see. So <laughs> um, that's absolutely crucial for understanding Dickens. Also certain features of his writing, because um, his, his work would be read, you know, no telly in those days. So after supper, uh, the father uh, would be... Uh, would read uh, aloud to the family and a uh, phrase from our mutual friend, um, anything calculated to bring a, a, a blush into the cheeks of a young person cannot be allowed. You see, so the squeamishness, as it were, although Holly Furneaux and myself and others would maintain there's a much more um, sleaze beneath the surface in Dickens and it initially meets the eye, it can't be there explicitly because the father is going to have to read that to his innocent virgin daughter. Literarily, it's also very interesting because Dickens um, authorized many, many writers in their own minds for using dialect using proper dialect, um, uh, because it, it, it hadn't been used in many literatures and cultures. There was only the high style. Um, and so as Dickens became more and more discovered, authors in Africa, authors in China, and various places started using dialect and using the, the language of the streets. And so that reading aloud became a part of many, many other cultures turning towards their own vernaculars. Very important literarily in terms of literary history globally. It's a good question. I'm sneaking in another question too, sorry. <laughs> uh, just in relation to that and, and the youth culture, the, uh, the nine pages of Dickens, I just wonder whether that um, bastardization, if that's the word to use, or the cultural adaption, if that's a, a finer way of putting it, whether that's uh, something that you feel a bit affronted with. I'm just interested in your opinions that it's not the, the pure version of, of Dickens or whether you see it, it, it's what's enabling it to continue to be so richly read. I'm just uh, inter interested in your opinions. Well, in the case, in the case of the youth culture book, I, I, the author gave a very convincing performance of sincerity about wanting to make Dickens accessible to the youth of today, but I, I, I'm afraid I wasn't convinced about that. But, um, but I, yeah, I don't think Dickens needs to be translated in that sense. He needs to be heard, as Michael mm. demonstrated so eloquently for us, I think. So that would be my view of that. These readathons, readings aloud, are starting up in many places. In London, for instance, the uh, Leatherhall Market in May, and John Dix, the Secretary of Dickens Fellowship, and possibly someone might be interested in doing the same sort of thing. You know, like Joyce, Ulysses is read every, every 4th of, 14th of yep. July, all, all over the globe. So, there's a beginning of the same sort of, because Dickens is to be read aloud, and got a lot of fun, especially with a bit of booze. He liked uh, <laughs> punch. Uh, <laughs> he was very good at making punch. And uh, that's part of the attraction of Bloomsday, of course. Uh, and uh, maybe, you know, who knows, that someone might be interested in doing that, reading aloud with a group of people. Oh, hi. Um, I'm wondering, um, to anyone's knowledge, if um, any writers have tried to superimpose um, Dickens's characters with the geopolitical bullies and paupers of the world? And if not, um, whether anyone would hazard a guess? Or have a shot at that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, when um, Nugugi um, talked, uh, he 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 credited Dickens in um, decolonizing the mind. When Nugugi was very interested, and in, indeed all the the decolonizing African authors, many of them uh, credited Dickens with first when they were children reading sort of redacted versions of Dickens at school. 
um, under colonialism. When they started coming out and writing themselves, that's one of the things that they were interested in. I mean, the technical term is ideological state apparatuses. These are the government institutions that actually um, Dickens was so critical of, whether it was the state, whether it was the law, whether it was the prison. Dickens was hugely critical of some of the big institutions of society. And many, many authors, I mean, Africa immediately comes to mind because all of those great decolonizing African authors um, did criticize those same institutions in their terms, very often neo-colonial institutions. Yeah, so that's, that's a very good question. Excuse me? Ngugi. 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 Watiango. Ngugi Watiango. The book is Decolonizing N the Mind. N apostrophe G-U-G-I. N -G -U -G -I. Good question. I've got a question up here. Um, I was really interested in all of those examples of books that were translated. But given that not all of Dickens' work at the time resonated, some of his titles fell flat, I'm wondering if there are any that haven't caught the imagination, any that nobody's interested in translating. Are there hidden or lost works or, or ones that just haven't kept going for the 200 years? Good. Yeah, I mean, one, what I would just say before I turn to the others is that um, the Russians were the only ones who consistently loved late Dickens. Right, the, the late novels, right, the late great, very long Dickens. The Russians were the ones who did consistently love them, and they kind of fit with the culture of, as Michael mentioned, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and the rest. And certainly Galdos did too. But for um, other cultures, very often they started with the works that were more easily translated. Some of the earlier works, the works where the plot is less complex, less kind of complicated and things. And so um, I don't know any that have never been translated. Though. Oh, Our Mutual Friend has not been translated into lots of languages. Oh, into oh, lots there's of no, languages. There's no, um, you know, I mean, there's no novel that hasn't been translated at, at all. all. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, 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 I think there's a very mixed picture in Europe anyway about which novels you know, our mutual friend, for instance, which many people well, certainly would be high up amongst the masters, is yet pretty unknown in many countries. Not been translated into Czech or Bulgarian, for instance. Czech being a very highly literary culture, and a friend of mine, Stenek Beran, is trying to tra get money to do so, uh, to translate it into Czech. But um, in other countries, Italy, for instance, Italo Calvino is a great admirer of our mutual friend. Um, and of course, it's a um, great masterpiece. And Germany also. So, I mean, it ver the, that picture, I think, varies from country to country. Where, But it's certainly true that, um, following on from England itself, really, the, where um, Thackeray was supposed to have killed off Dickens, you know, I don't think uh, Thackeray felt that. He hadn't, you know, but there were people who thought, ah, along come Thackeray and Dickens is on the decline. So there are later novels that are less admired. Uh, way, way up the back. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, even from this perspective, it's very good. So on this side, hello. I thought when I walked in that it was Finlay Curry sitting in Michael's chair. But I wanted to hear if you could say a little bit more about the impact, as I understand it, of the serialisation of the novels and, for example, the public anticipation of the next instalment. Did that have an impact upon Dickens and his writing? And any other comments you have about him in that contemporary period rather than now, 200 years after his birth? I mean, the, the serialisation was hugely important. Uh, um, and it's part of Dickens' own efforts to create a mass popular readership for himself. I mean, it's a canny mode of uh, publication. It, gets pu it enables him to bypass the circulating libraries, this new form of publication. I should say, most of Dickens' the, the big novels mostly come out in monthly instalments over um, 18 months, 19 parts, the last part, the last uh, instalment being a double number. And um, uh, it, it was a cheaper mode of publication for people to buy the, the instalments than if they were confronted with purchasing a three-volume novel 
um, at the outset. So it's important for the public. It, it did, yes, have an impact on Dickens' own thinking about the planning of his novels as well, because as you can imagine, he's not having to think about the whole, the shape of the whole thing, but the shape of each instalment as well. So um, it, yes is the answer. He, it, it does have a, a major effect. Yeah, can I add to that? You know, Dickens was terribly responsive, hearing what people were saying if they didn't buy. You know, Martin Chuzzlewit is probably the worst. The first numbers of Martin Chuzzlewit didn't sell at all well. So he sent Martin Chuzzlewit to America in order to boost sales. Um, he could respond to letters from uh, members of the audience. So in David Copperfield, not for the best, I think, uh, 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 he. Um, has this wonderful dwarf character, Miss Moucher, who's really very racy and risky, risky, risky. and uh, um, a, a dwarf lady said, I think you based her on me, you know, you've seen me out walking. And so he changes her and makes her into a goody-goody dwarf. And then it's really awful when she comes back. You know, she's no longer this wonderful, vivid, funny character. Uh, so he um, responded as he was going along to, you know... Um, but this is part of, I think, the, the theatrical, you know, the wanting an audience, wanting a direct contact with the audience and not, you know, the sort of in your private closet where you read the book and you have no contact with the author. He wanted that kind of real reach out to people. So it's a strength, really, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. mm. Juliet John calls it an intimate public, mm. paradoxical term, but that's really what he was after. And he ended up reading his own books, killed himself, really. Mm. So doing that, again, you know, rather obsessed with murdering Nancy uh, um, for psychological reasons. They say people used to faint when mm. Dickens would read The Murder of Nancy. Yeah. And he would faint yeah. himself. Mm. Yeah. He, yeah. Afterwards, he was yeah, really, was his so doctors exhausted. told him he'd got to give it up. And he did, eventually, but it was too late. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about Dickens. Um, the way you described him being read in the living room is, seemed like, you know, he's a very popular writer. And like nowadays we have that uh, distinction between kind of literary fiction and popular fiction. And, you know, think about um, Dickens' relationship to journalism as well as a more kind of popular form of writing. So I'm just wondering, um, like, it reminds me of, you know, families nowadays reading Harry Potter and a more kind of popular cultural kind of um, identity for, for Dickens than what we kind of tend to see him now as a kind of a high culture literary fiction kind of writer? Well, I, I, th I think um, those kinds of distinctions are in the process of formation in the 19th century. And Dickens is, is very distinctive in being read across the board. It's one of the wonderful things about him. Um, uh, and yes, the link between, the, 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 the relationship between journalism and literature is a lot closer too, I think, than, than it is now. These are these, as I say, these are professions in the process of formation in the 19th century. Well, I mean, certainly, I mean, obviously popular culture shifts and changes. I think Dickens certainly thought of himself as having a role. I mean, there's a phrase where he writes in a letter, I believe that the holding of popular literature through a kind of popular dark age depends upon my such fantastical treatment as mine. You know, that he, he saw himself in it because keeping alive. Uh, uh, and he was called Mr. Popular Sentiment by Trollope, who you know, looked down his nose at him. So, so, I mean, certainly, but these things shift, and clearly you could see Dickens as belonging to an elite who you wanted to these days, um, you know, from a, 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 a different perspective. We just, the whole, whole mass culture uh, is in its infancy, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I'm on. Um, I just a quick, a straightforward question. Really enjoyable session, by the way. Um, about the popular sentiment issue, I read something um, about Dickens recently. I think it was about the, the character Little Nell, uh, the death of Little Nell. 
when she died young. And uh, when it was published at the time, the word around London was that nobody could read about the death of Little Nell without crying. And, um, and then Oscar Wilde's response to that year later was nobody can read about the death of Little Nell without laughing. Now, so I'm just, my question, just a straightforward one, I mean, do you, was, is it a valid criticism of Dickens to be too uh, sentimental, to be too Mr. Sentiment sometimes? What Wilde said is you have, to have, you have to have a heart of stone not to laugh at the death of little Nell. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. um, and, and certainly the sympathy that Dickens had for children was something that did seem to capture an almost universal imagination. Yeah, so you can say that from one perspective it is sentimental, from another perspective the whole world seems to come on and talk about orphans in that way in literary history globally. So you can talk about the sentiment but you can also talk about the universality of that sentiment. One of the really interesting triangles that happens in literary history is that between Gal Dost Dostoevsky and Dickens, and Michael has written very well about this, what you get is Dostoevsky and Gal Dost rewriting the story of Little Nell. Um, in Dostoevsky, it's the insulted and the injured, it's called, the insulted and the injured. Yes. And what you get is Dostoevsky actually exposing the abuse Right, the actual sexual abuse mm -hmm. of Little Nell in ways that Dickens yeah. could not do because of yeah. his pure mindedness, mm -hmm. because of the reading aloud. Dickens, when he showed the abuse of a child, a young woman, he couldn't actually be explicit about it, but Dostoevsky could. And in The Insulted and the Injured, that's what he shows. And so there, it's not a question of being sentimental, it's a question of Dickens opening something up that another writer was able to really take and push through. Yes, in, in the insulted and the injured, uh, Nell is a prostitute, is a child prostitute. And the opening of her Okiresti shop, the, uh, the subtext of that is this, this old man walking in the Haymarket, which was the home of child prostitutes, and there is this girl on the streets, and he's wondering, what's she doing here? She's, it's her grandfather is a gambling, and compulsive gambler, that she's waiting for him to come home. Not anything to do with the Haymarket. But, you know, that frisson is there. It's the subtext that I, you know, that there is beneath the. Uh, Rich Ryan readers would have recognized that. Dickens would never say, and that would have seemed to mean that she's a prostitute. Mm -hmm. you know. I think I'd want to bring the question of, of the sentimentality back to this idea of community too. It's this effective community that Dickens wants to share with his, he wants readers to share feeling about the characters and it's got a, it's, it, it's part of that social concern that he has. He, he genuinely believes that people can be brought together, I think, through imaginative um, engagement with literature and, and the feeling powers of literature. Mm. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> okay. um, I think actually we're out of time. Yes, so um, if you would join me in thanking our panel. And thank you all for coming. very intriguing and interesting discussion this evening. So hopefully you will all will have received some of the further reading notes that State Library staff have prepared for you. There are copies outside if you miss them on the way in and you can uh, download them from our website as well as the podcast that will be up in a few days. And if you enjoyed this talk, please keep an eye out for more National Year of Reading talks, workshops and events in our What's On brochure and at our website. So good night and we hope to see you back here quite soon. Thanks.